Happy Mother's Day, everyone. Um, I just wanted to get started with some funny parenting memes uh, to start our Mother's Day off with. So let's take a look at the first one. Here's the first kid's room, and then the second kid's room. And isn't it funny how the first kid has everything in order and it's just perfect, and then the second child and any children that come along afterwards, they're, they're lucky if they even get a bed, right? Um, let's take another look at the next slide. There's the first time parent, he has it all together. Then a month later, he's looking kind of shocked. And four years and two more kids later, and it's like you're talking to a volleyball right there in the middle of the desert because you don't feel like anybody's listening, right? Uh, the next slide for some parents, you look at how it looks to lay a baby down, but how it feels. It's like a ticking time bomb. It's going to go off if you step on that crack in, in the floor. Here's my friend Jessica. She's 27, and she says, parenting isn't stressful at all. And the last one is what you thought parenting would be look like, what it would look like. And there it is, all your kids all lined up in a row, ready to sing a wonderful song. But the next slide, what it's really like. So I just find those memes kind of funny because we all have ideals and we all have Instagrammable moments. I remember um, even back in the day when we didn't have Instagram that I tried to get my son to take a picture to that he would look like this other picture from years ago from somebody in our family. And so I had him like put his elbow down and his chin on his hand and it was one of those moments where nothing, it wasn't right. So I kept saying, do it again, do it again. And after 40 minutes, he was crying because it wasn't perfect. And I was trying to make it perfect. What I'm trying to say is, I think in all of our lives, we want to be perfect parents and our kids do not need perfect parents. They need genuine and true and honest parents. Um, I know that we can strive to be perfect. And for some of us, like myself, you know, we see our flaws and we see our imperfections and we can tend to beat ourselves up because they're not, you know, we're not perfect. But we have the wrong description of the word perfect. What the Bible says is in Matthew 5, 48, that we're to be perfect like our heavenly father is perfect. And what that word actually means is not having uh, everything all together correct right now. It is complete. It is whole. It's being mature. It's having, I'm, a, I'm maturing in areas I'm learning about as a parent. It's, you know, an advancement to an end. I'm having a process and I'm progressing in that process. It's not about like being flawless, but it's being, it is about desiring, moving to a desired end. So listen, I just wanted to say that parenting is one of the most amazing journeys that you will ever have, but it's also filled with two very strong and powerful emotions, joy and guilt. And on any given occasion, you can feel full of joy because you're doing things great, and then you get this, this, you're overridden with guilt because of the decisions that you've made maybe that day where you failed, and they come in all kinds of ways. For me, as being a parent of five kids, you know, it came as like I wasn't patient enough, I didn't listen enough, I didn't do it calmly, or I wasn't firm, or I wasn't fun. I didn't make the cupcakes for my kids like I should have made, and the other parent made them and brought them for them to school. And there's also failures where I know I've sinned and I've done things that weren't pleasing to God, and those feelings all just kind of get weighed on our shoulders to the point where, for me, Mother's Day was always something I hated. I just didn't want to celebrate it, you know, when my husband would say, hey, let's, let's decide what we're going to do for Mother's Day. What do you want to do? And I would say, nothing. Let's celebrate like your mom and my mom. But me, I don't want to celebrate because I've seen my failures, right? But Christ came for those failures. And I learned that those things that were happening, if they were convicting me, then I needed to say I was sorry and repent. 
But if they were condemning me and making me feel badly, they weren't God. That, that wasn't from God. When I asked for forgiveness and he forgave me, then I could move forward like that perfect description describes. So let's look at two scriptures on how to love our kids well. The first one is Psalm 127.1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. If you want to love your kids well, Follow Psalm 127.1. Let God be the master builder. He has the blueprints. You know, when somebody's building a house, they have a master builder. And that person brings in blueprints and unrolls them and shows where the foundation's going to go and then when the walls are going to come up and they'll lay another layer over it. And so there's a building process. And if God is our master builder as a parent, then I have what I need in that moment to follow his plan to raise my kids. His blueprint is the word of God. His blueprint has all the things that I need to build my family, to show me what to do next, to represent what I should look like. I kind of liken it to, you know, when you go and purchase a, a project in a box, like I'm gonna build a shelf or a desk, whatever and I follow the blueprint, which is the instructions, I look at that picture and then I sit on the floor and screw it all together and then I put another piece. And it, when I look at the picture, sometimes it doesn't show up like mine looks like. So I have to go back and look at the blueprint and see where did I mess up? What do I need to change? Um, and that's what God's, God's word is to us. It's the vision of what our kids should look like. So he's not, also, he's not just a, a consult. Like, I don't just call him in on special problems. I don't just say, oh, God, please help me. My, my child is, like, having an issue right here. And then when, when that issue's over and everything's fine, I just say, okay, now I'm going to go do things my own way because I know what I want to see, and I don't want to miss out on, like, some great things that other families look like they're doing, other moms look like they're doing. Um, but God has to be there the whole entire process of the way. Because if I use him as a consult, then I'm going to be doing the laboring in vain when he's not there to help and guide me. And it's going to become empty what I'm doing and fruitless and pointless. And it might actually cost me in the long run. And I might have to go back and start all over again in some areas to make it right. The other scripture is Proverbs 14.1. The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish one tears it down with her own hands. You know, if we have God as our master builder, then we're going to fall into being a wise woman, building our house. We want to be diligent and prudent with what we're doing. Um, we want to improve our family by building on the word, by building with God's wisdom, and by building with the help of others. Because let's face it, we all know that we can tear down our houses pretty easily. Um, that comes easy. And I've heard it said that, you know, following God is simple, but it's not easy when, you have, when you're building the right way. Um, tearing a house down, I could just tell you right now, my actions, my words, the way that I communicate, my attitude, my kids see that. You know, and in, in our house growing up, uh, the kids growing up, the way uh, Rick would say something, and when he turned around, if I rolled my eyes, there I was, tearing my house down, right? Because I was showing it in my expressions. I was showing it in my reactions to things that were said. My kids are watching. Like the time that Rick came home from work, and he, back then there was a five and a three-year-old in our house, and he said, how was everyone's day? And one of them yelled out, fine, once mommy got nice. So I was like, great, that's, you know, you just outed me right there. Um, but it's true. They see and notice those things. So I just want to share with you three things that we can do to love our kids well. And those three things are, number one, you can't give what you don't have. Number two, realize that love takes time. And number three, know the season that you're in. So let's just take a look at number one. You can't give what you don't have. If I'm not immersing myself in God's love, there's no way love's going to pour out of me 
towards my children. So I have to ask myself, what am I doing to communicate that I'm receiving that love, to give that love? Um, and that goes back to looking at some things that are just simple steps. Am I reading the Word of God on a regular basis? Am I having my devotion time? Uh, how about worship and singing out loud? I know, you know, we sang today, and the songs that we sing, even if I would have spent on several day, on several occasions, singing those songs in my house in the morning, it probably would have changed the way my whole day went, reminding myself that praying is important and praying the scriptures are important. It's also important to listen to podcasts. I have to laugh because back in the day, I would listen to the radio to get my encouragement. You know, at certain times that we had to go and sit by the radio. But today we have so many podcasts that we could encourage ourselves with and fill ourselves up with so that we're full of, of the goodness of God that we're able to give out to others. I need help by, putting, by placing women in my life on a regular basis, um, investing in me and helping me to grow and flourish to become all that God wants me to be as a mom. Um, I remember years ago, I had trouble with yelling at my kids. And uh, there was a woman that came to my house regularly, uh, once a week, and we would communicate, talk, pray, share scripture, and then, you know, in an hour, she was gone. And it was a, a regular occurrence. And at one point I said, I need you to help me because I just yell at my kids all of the time. And she spoke such great words of encouragement. She said, well, you know, why don't you practice talking nicely? And I just had to laugh because I've never thought of that. And she said, well, it's not odd that people ride their bikes and put training wheels on and go up and down the street. Uh, so why would it be odd for you to practice something spiritual? And so she, I remember her saying, when your kids aren't home, you know, speak out into the air in a normal sounding voice. Allow yourself to hear yourself speak kind but firm. The, the repercussions of what they've done wrong. And as I practiced that, I got better. And I wasn't yelling at my kids anymore to the point where when I would respond, they would be like, is that my mother? You know, because I had learned something new from someone else. So I put something in there that I didn't have. Um, the second thing is realizing that love takes time. It's a work in progress and it takes time to build. The thing that Rick and I like to talk about are our prime times, our drive time, our meal times, and our bedtimes. Those were our prime times investing in our kids that did take time when we're driving. You know, often we wanted to put our own music on or listen to something that we preferred, like sports talk. But we were challenged to shut that off and allow the kids in the car to communicate with us and to talk. Our meal times, we spent a lot of time um, playing games, reading chapter books, doing goofy things. We sat around the table four to five times a week with no television, with food, and we would, we would eat, talk, and ask questions, and then play games. Those were valuable investments of our time. Bedtime, stories and prayer time, when the kids are winding down for the day, it was so important to like communicate to them that we're gonna pray with you now and believe believe with you and pray over the things that are concerning to you. But there was one little it factor. And what it was, was when we were done in one certain child's room, that I would try, you know, to race out, kiss that child goodnight and race out because that particular child was the one that would talk for 40 more minutes about things that she learned in the dictionary. Um, and so those were kind of like funny memories, but it, they were important. It's still important to invest in your kids. And so that might mean for us, we need to get our priorities in order. We need to look at our calendar and our schedules and where are we investing our times as moms and where we need to maybe cut something out for the here and now and to add in something different. Um, you know, even as, grown, as I have grown adult children, I still have to invest in them, but it's just a different way. I look for ways to communicate with them and put things on my calendar so I'm meeting up with them and maybe 
taking a nap before I meet up with them because they like meeting later in the night, right? <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's always planning, how do I want to invest in spending time to make a difference in my kids? The third thing is the, the knowing the season that you're in. And there's a chart that communicates the years uh, and what those years are. From zero to four, it's discipline years. From five to 12, it's when you train your children. At 13 to 20, the coaching time. And then 21 and up, it's our friendship time. It's the, where our kids, you know, they're, they're more of our friends. And you might need to go ahead and look at that and, and, and see where are you? What season are you in? Because, you know, you might be in zero to four where all you're doing is action equal, equals consequences. Or you might be in the next season where you're repeating, repeating, repeating. And um, you're saying, look them in the eye and say hi. You're, you're giving them valuable training. Uh, the coaching, you know, where we're helping our children to be able to figure out how to solve problems on their own and, you know, we're not hovering over them and we're not solving problems for them, but we're giving them a safe place to, to fail and maybe not do it right, but we're going to coach them and train them how, how that should happen maybe the next time. And then afterwards, at 21 and up, we're pursuing them and investing in them and being their biggest cheerleaders. Um, so if I switch gears here, if I were to say, if I were to speak to myself, my younger self in my 20s and 30s, uh, if I could go back, I'd get a pound of chocolate and a cup of co coffee and sit down with myself and just communicate three things. One would be relax, just relax. You don't have to be so uptight. There was a season in life where I was so uptight and I I think I put like rules and regulations in order, not that we don't need those, but I put those above just relaxing and having fun and not sweating the small stuff, laughing more and stressing less. The second thing, I would avoid the comparison trap. I'd tell myself, you know, it really doesn't matter where, what you have in your home, what you communicate to your kids about their furniture, their games, their toys, their clothes, their shoes, material things really don't matter. So don't, don't be competitive with the next lady next to you. Um, I have a picture of my kids, and this picture is from one of their weddings. And even though my kids are 24 to 31 currently, I wanted to ask them as their adult selves, what, what Christmas gift meant the most to them. So we were together this past January and I asked that question and they all just kind of like paused and they were thinking, which I thought was great. They're thinking about which gift we purchased them that meant the most. And it was quiet and nobody thought of anything. And I'm thinking, okay, I know we spent money on you. You can't think of one gift we bought you. And then one of them piped up and they said, I know, Christmas bread. And I said, Christmas bread, really? Um, Christmas bread, why? And they said, because it just reminds us of Christmas morning where we would get a cup of coffee, the bread was warm, we'd put a lot of butter on it, we'd sit down and talk. And, you know, I got this recipe from a friend years ago. It was the best ever yeast rolls that I would use just as a filler to my dinners at, at night. And I only ever really used that side of the recipe until like one year I flipped it over and it said uh, braided sweet bread. And I thought, oh, that looks interesting. Maybe I'll make that for Christmas. And I did. And then I made it again for the following Christmas and then the following Christmas. And it just never dawned on me that that would be something, you know, so special. Um, I even remember when... Um, one year, not all of the kids would be around and Rick had hurt his back. So we were gonna like kind of just change everything that we did. And we got a smaller tree and we weren't gonna do as much. And I thought to myself, I'm not making the bread this year. We're just gonna have a very chill Christmas. And till one of the kids showed up prior to Christmas and said, well, you have such a little tree. I hope you're like still making the bread. So that kind of made me laugh, like these moments, this, this moment meant so much to them. It was the memory. Um, it wasn't the, uh, the Legos or the extended version of a game or a piano or a guitar. It was the memories of that sweetbread. 
And the third thing that I would tell my younger self is to enjoy every moment because it goes fast. And I know there are some that are going to hear this and be like, oh, that we hear that all the time. And I know you're probably in one of two camps. You're either in the mom camp that laments about the days that used to be and the years gone by, or you're the mom that is the new mom and you're kind of complaining like, what does she mean? Like, enjoy the days. I have, you know, a snot, snotty kid and they're throwing up and I'm not sleeping at night. And, you know, so maybe I would change the words to say value every moment because they really do go by. The seasons go by fast. That's what I would tell my younger self. But, you know, I'm older now and I still need to hear things to communicate my love to my kids at the age that I'm at. So what I would tell myself here and now and what maybe some of you older moms might want to tell your kids or tell yourself is this, I'm still needed. You know, I'm still needed in my kids' lives, even though it may not look like it, even though they're grown adults and they're so independent. You know, sometimes I think they don't need me, but that's what we raise our kids for, right? To be grown, independent adults. But I realized one day that my kids do still need me because I still get text messages from them and they say something like this. Hey, if you leave the pasta sauce out all night by accident, is it still going to be good to eat? They say things like, what's a brisket and how do you make that? They also send you pictures of their finger and say, do I need stitches? <laughs> so I'm still needed. Sometimes I feel like the John Quinones, what would you do, mom? Um, I'm still needed to pray for them, to encourage them, and to share wisdom. They, they ask for those things along the way. I'm still their parent, and as long as I'm alive, I'm called to invest in them. No matter what choices my adult kids are making that I agree or disagree with, it's up to them and God now. I, but I haven't lost the chance to invest in them in the best way I feel God is telling me to do that. We think because they're grown adults they don't need us, they really still do. The second thing I would communicate is be fervent in prayer and trust the Holy Spirit. Be passionate and intensely passionate about the Word of God and praying that over your, over your situations that may look like they're impossible to you, but they're not impossible to God. Pray scriptures, insert your child's name. Um, I know somebody told me years ago that my kids are going to need a Savior someday. They're, it's not going to be me. And that kind of like shocked me back into reality that that is the truth, that, that they're going to rely on adult life between them and God. They're not going to always just rely on me. The third thing I would say is to be intentional. Do things on purpose with purpose. At my age, I have to stay engaged. I have to know what they're talking about. I have to invest in what they're interested in and go places with them that are, that are there of their interest and not just what I want. I would make phone calls and you know, communicate uh, what calendar dates are the best for us to get together and then plan those things out to happen. Meals, coffee times, even when it would inconvenience me, it's like I have to ask God, what am I doing to invest and be intentional with my kids? And I look at that because I, I think that at some point our kids are going to communicate something about us. And I want to know, you know, in the next five years, in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, what is it that I want them to communicate about me to others? Now, look, I'm not looking for them to give me accolades and say how great I am. I'm just saying I want them to remember some good quality things. And so when I think about the years down the road, it makes me change the way I act and communicate in the here and now, how I love them and how I pursue them. So the last thing that I want to talk about is this ring, this picture of a, a, an engagement ring. Now, it's not anyone's ring that I know, but two of my children did get engaged and recently got married last year in May. And I found that not one of them had anybody tell them, you know, 
take their hand, look at their ring and say, oh my goodness, there's so many flaws. Who on earth got you that? No, they, people gushed over their ring. They looked at their ring and they thought it was so beautiful and it sparkled so, so nicely in the sun. And I'd like to compare our lives as moms to that diamond where, you know, when I look at myself, I see my flaws and my imperfections and I think like everybody else probably sees them too. But in reality, that isn't the truth because when I let the light of Jesus shine on me, and shine on my diamond life, and I have asked for forgiveness, and I am choosing to grow and change in my ways towards my children, then, then people see that sparkle, and they are drawn to God. They are drawn to, you know, my ring, my life, is a reflection of God's love, not only to my children, but to others. So we are the right color. We are the right cut. We are in clarity when we have God's word. And he has given us his certificate, which states that we are real diamonds in his eyes. And we have God's stamp of approval on our lives. And so I just want to encourage you that you can love your kids well and that you can do it no matter what age they are.